So let's see that little uh, simple application that we're going to use today. Um, so first, I'm going to clone the repo that has not only the code for the simple app, but also all the slides, all the scripts, everything. That's the the repo with everything. So git clone. Um, this is big enough, I suppose, so that everybody can read it. Okay, perfect. Git clone https github.com slash jpetazo, that's me, slash container dot training. Uh, I'm on node one, yeah, absolutely. And after cloning that repo, I'm going to have a look at what's in there. Uh, so for instance, I have a slides directory, which as you can guess, contains the slides I was presenting. Um, but I also have a Docker coins directory, and that's the directory containing the demo app. So I'm going to dive into that Docker coins directory. And here, um, there is one file that gives me a hint about what's going on. That's the Docker Compose YAML file. A, doc a Docker Compose YAML file is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of marker, a hallmark of, hey, this is using Compose uh, to describe uh, a containerized application. It's a little bit, you know, like when, when you have a make file, you know you can type make and something should happen. If you have a vagrant file, you can do vagrant up. When you have a gem file, it means, oh, this is probably a Ruby application and I can use Bundler to install dependencies. For Python, we have requirements.txt. For Java, we could have like pomxml to install stuff with Maven, etc., etc. So in that case, docker-compose.yaml means I can run one specific command, docker compose up. When I do that, it's going to pass that file and build and run containers. So I'm going to do that because it's going to take a couple of minutes to, 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 to prepare everything. And while it does that, I'm going to explain what's in, uh, in this YAML file. So in this YAML file, um, I have a bunch of services, and each service will correspond to one container. So I have RNG, I have Hasher, I have WebUI, etc., etc. Some of these services are just using a pre-built image coming from the Docker Hub or any other registry. For instance, the Redis service is just using image Redis. But then the other services have a build command. The build command means we're going to build a custom container image using uh, the files in that directory. In that case, the web UI uh, service is using files from the web UI directory. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of a boring person, so I decided that service X would be in directory X, service Y in directory Y, etc., etc. So here, uh, I have four directories corresponding to the four services that I want to build. And in each of these directories, I will have a Docker file and then some source code. Same thing in RNG, I have a Docker file and some source code. And if I look at these Docker files, uh, they are extremely simple Docker files. Because again, the goal here is to learn about orchestration, not about like best practices to build the, the optimal best container ever. Um, so everything is kept really simple. Um, even the source code for these applications is super simple. If we look at, for instance, the, the, the source code for the RNG service, it's um, 32 lines of Python. The most complicated uh, service is the Walker service, which clocks at 70 lines of Python. So I, I tried my best to have something really as small as possible, just in case at some point you want to tweak that and tinker with it. It should, it should hopefully be fairly easy to, to dive in. Um, and again, I, we picked different languages. Um, so uh, we have... Um, two Python services, one Ruby service, and uh, one Node.js service. The, the goal was like, okay, I hope that if you want to tweak the application, they will, you will know at least one of these three languages. So after uh, a few minutes, the Compose has built all these containers and started all these containers. And what I see here is the output of my containers. On the left-hand side, there is what I call the rainbow strip, which is just the name of the containers. Uh, and on the right-hand side, that's the output of the containers themselves. 
if I just pause that for a moment, um, I see that I have things here that strongly look like HTTP logs. So there's, there appears to be like a few web services uh, in that application and they constantly receive traffic. So let's see a little bit like what this application is about. This application is a Docker coin miner. Unfortunately, DockerCoin is not a real cryptocurrency. Uh, otherwise, I might be able to retire soon because I've been delivering this like for years now. Um, the way that DockerCoins works is that I have a worker that does an infinite loop. And in that loop, it's going to generate some random bytes, hash these bytes, and do nothing with them. Just increment the counter. Hash, so generate data, hash the data, increment the counter, and repeat forever and ever and ever. And since we have this counter, then we have a little web UI uh, to show how fast the, the counter is going. Um, so normally, if we wanted to implement something like that, we would just like have like maybe four or five lines of code. Like we would okay use the random package of our programming language, then some crypto or hashing package to compute the hash and increment a, an integer, and that's it. But since we are in the microservice era, instead we are going to generate the random bytes by calling a web service. So I have a web service whose job is to generate random data. I have another service whose job is to hash the data, so we pass the data to that service. And the, the counter, instead of just being a local integer, it's a counter in Redis, which is why we have all these different services. It might not be the, the best way to implement that, but at least it gives us multiple services communicating together, so it has a really high um, <laughs> educational value. Um, so this is a little diagram to show that. So we have the worker doing get requests to RNG, the random number generator, then posting the result to Hasher, and then communicating with Redis to increment the counter. Uh, and the web UI is also communicating with Redis to retrieve the value of the counter, and us, the user here, uh, is looking at the web UI. Um, so how do the, the different services uh, discover each other and talk to each other? Like, are we like hard coding IP addresses of containers or something like that? No, um, with containers, the way we do service discovery is by just using the name of the service. If I want to connect the Redis service, I use the name Redis in the code, not like 192.168.xyz, just I put Redis. If I want to make a request to web service RNG, that's a request to HTTP colon slash slash RNG slash 32. The 32 here is the number of random bytes that I want to obtain. Okay. Um, right. So now we could look at the web UI and see how fast the application is, is working. Um, so to, to, to find out, uh, the port of that web UI, I'm going to use like the docker compose ps command. It's telling me, okay, the, the web UI is running on port 8000. This information is also in the compose.yml file. Here it's telling me web UI port 8000, right? So I'm going to connect to the IP address of node 1. Uh, so 35.180.98.50, port 8000. And I get this, that's the web UI. And it shows me that I'm doing like four hashes per second. 